Good evening to you all. I'm Jane Wall, Executive Director of the Emily Dickinson Museum, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you this evening to part three of our series that brings you behind the scenes with collections. During part one, we took a look at the scope and history of the museum's collection, and we heard from Nan Wolverton, a curator of New England decorative arts who created the furnishings plan for the museum's two historic houses. During part two, we dove deep into the paper objects within our collection with conservator Carolyn Frieza to look at enticing discoveries and the particular requirements for storage and conservation of paper artifacts. During tonight's final presentation for this year, we will be speaking with Hampshire College Professor Lee Sanders about her research involving a particular textile object in the museum's collection, a shawl attributed to Emily Dickinson. Then later in the program, we'll be making a pretty exciting announcement about our collection, so please stay tuned for that. Now, just a little housekeeping for Zoom um, is that we encourage you to engage in the chat during the program, uh, the chat feature of Zoom, but uh, to have your question answered by us at the end of the program, uh, please type them into the Q&A box, uh, which you can find in the Zoom toolbar. So um, I think a brief recap of how the collection was formed won't be in this because it's a little bit complicated. So here goes. The Dickinson Homestead was built by Emily's grandfather, Samuel Fowler Dickinson, in 1813. And with the exception of about 15 years, the Dickinson family owned the house for a full century until 1916, when uh, the last heir in Emily's immediate family, her niece, Martha Dickinson Bianchi, sold the homestead. Uh, and at that time, she gave away or sold, auctioned some of the homestead's contents, but the vast majority of them remained. And she moved all of those items, uh, household furnishings and personal belongings, next door to the Evergreens, which was her own family home. So this means that some Dickinson family belongings have been dispersed to uh, locations unknown. Um, just saying, they might be out there. Uh, and at her death in 1943, Martha's friend and literary assistant, Alfred Hampson, inherited the Evergreens and all of its contents. So he and his wife, Mary, occupied the house and maintained it as much uh, as possible as it was during Martha's own residence. And this all uh, continued until Mary's death in 1988. Uh, Mary Hampson's will established uh, a trust named for Martha Dickinson Bianchi to develop the property as a cultural facility for scholars and the public. And then the trust proceeded with this charge until it transferred ownership of the Evergreens to Amherst College in 2003. So at the time the trust was established in 1992, the Evergreens remained fully furnished with Dickinson family furniture, artwork, household accoutrements, uh, cooking equipment, and personal items. In addition, the Martha Dickinson Bianchi Trust became the owner of personal belongings of Alfred and Mary Hampson that remained at the Evergreens that hadn't been uh, disposed of otherwise. Uh, in 1950, several hundred Dickinson family books and Dickinson's poem manuscripts and a few dozen objects associated with Emily Dickinson uh, were transferred to Harvard University, the Houghton Library Special Collections by uh, the Hampsons themselves. And then finally, uh, Mary Hampson's will left the remaining couple of thousand books and uh, all of the remaining manuscript material to Brown University. So there's a final little piece of collections objects and that was uh, manuscript material retained by Mabel Todd that her daughter uh, transferred to Amherst College in the 1960s. So among the more than 8,000 objects remaining at the Evergreens, um, are well over a thousand textile items. And to give you an idea of uh, the condition of these items, 
1992 when uh, the Evergreens became more of a, a, a public facility, a cultural facility. Just, just imagine um, generations of clothing hanging, still hanging in bedroom closets and um, young Gilbert Dickinson's clothes still lying in bureau drawers. Trunks of textiles packed up in the attics, blankets and towels from, well, say the 1970s, um, still stored away. Laces and sewing notions ranging from the mid 19th century up through the mid 20th century, just mingled together uh, in boxes and closets. So uh, this is sort of the task that uh, is before, was before the Emily Dickinson Museum. Um, a necessary approach to work at the Evergreens was back in the 1990s, uh, some really significant structural repairs and a new roof. In other words, taking care of the house before turning to the collection. Uh, and now we are at a point where we have turned to the collection uh, with a three-year project to catalog all 8,000 plus objects. And now collections manager, Megan Ramsey will show us um, a variety of these objects. So as Jane said, over the last three years, we've been cataloging the entirety of our collection. Um, and that comes with the help of funding from the Institute for Museum and Library Services. So that team was me, our collections assistant, Caitlin McGrath, and we had nine student interns over the last three years going through every single object in the collection. So everything from the fine art to the dining and cooking artifacts, all of the personal objects like wallets and sewing kits, um, and then obviously our textile collection as well. Um, so I'm gonna share some, um, some of the highlights from our textile collection. Um, so these first objects um, are pieces of lace. Um, there's lace netting and there's some, I think, cotton applique on top. And there was four pieces. So I'm just showing here two. Um, and we also found a note with these pieces, which helped us identify what they were. Um, so it says pieces of drawing room lace curtains, 1856 to 1958. Um, so that helps us identify that these are actually pieces of curtains. As you can see, they're not complete pieces. Um, they've been either cut or kind of ripped apart. Um, they're in pretty poor condition um, because if, if we can trust this note, they have been on display for 102 years. That's a long time for a curtain to be hung in a window. Um, so if that's true, that they took 102 years of sun damage, then at least there's something left of them. Yeah, so one of the really uh, fascinating things about going through these collections objects one by one is, is running across these little handwritten notes that Mary Hansen left. And what she's telling us with these notes is information that she either received directly from Martha Dickinson Bianchi or perhaps from Martha through her husband, Alfred, who knew Martha for longer than Mary did. Um, and so... You've come across a number of these. Yeah, and I'll share the next one. Also has a note from Mary. Um, so these are very large, heavy red drapes. Um, and these also are identified by Mary Hampson um, as the drawing room drapes. Um, and she actually has identified which window they came from, the west side north. Um, she calls it the drawing room. We call it the parlor now. Um, and the parlor has three windows and we found six drapes. So we have the full set of drapes um, and she we have notes with each one. Um, so it's really fascinating to to not only know, um, you know, in the for the lace curtains that she identified them as lace curtains. Otherwise, we might have just thought these are interesting pieces of lace. What could mm -hmm. these have been? Um, but then the fact that she actually gave us the exact location of where they hung is is really fascinating. Yeah, that that is really fascinating. She identifies the location so precisely, and then we get to match that up with um, other evidence. And in this case, there is a reminiscence by Martha Dickinson Bianchi in which she mentions these. And I've got, um, and it, she's what she's talking about is um, being at uh, one of her parents' parties uh, during her childhood. And this is what she says about that experience. She says, on the actual evening of the party, I was set to watch the parlor fire so that it wouldn't snap out on the rug. 
The chandelier with four shaded kerosene lamps was lighted, hanging down in the middle of the room, but high enough to be above the tallest person's head. There were the oil paintings in their gleaming gold frames and the big mirror over the mantel. I could see myself down to my knees in it. If I stood up on a chair, I could even see my feet in it. That's a nice little detail. <laughs> and what I loved most were the long damask curtains that hung way down to the floor. And when they were drawn over the French windows, made three big splashes of crimson. Lovely. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have a lot of table linens. Um, and these three pieces here, these napkins, all have embroidered Ds on them, which it's very exciting to know that these are Dickinson table linens. Um, and one thing I just wanted to call attention to with these is that you can also notice that there's creasing and staining on these objects. Um, so that lets us know that they've been folded for a very, very long time. Um, and that, that staining is also just from, they've been folded so long. So anything that was exposed either to air or might've been in contact with um, any of the, the wooden objects that, that they were stored into. Um, so some people might see that and wonder, would we wash these? Would we iron these? Would we make them more pristine? But I think the, the creasing and the staining tells its own story of kind of the long history of these objects. Mm -hmm. So going back to uh, the reminiscence, Martha's reminiscence that I just uh, mentioned. Um, so these, of course, just like in the present day, these monogram linens and silver flatware and silver vessels um, were all part and parcel of a well-appointed household. And in this case, we get a little bit more information from a, an inventory that Susan Dickinson drew up in 1895, where she listed um, that the dining room had four dozen doilies, seven dozen napkins, and one and a half dozen tablecloths. And we see a few of them here. <laughs> Staying with some of these table linens, here's a really interesting table runner um, with some uh, interesting embroidery on it. Uh, so you can see that there are three people, uh, looks like they're attached to leashes and there is a person behind them holding the reins. And then there is some, um, there are some letters below. We think that's in Cyrillic, um, possibly Russian. Uh, I don't personally speak Russian. So this is um, a really good example of an object that will need some more history. But Jane, why might we have Russian objects in our collection? Yeah, well, um, so as some, some folks know, in 1903, Martha Dickinson married a Russian cavalry officer, uh, uh, an officer loyal to the czar. Uh, she, Martha, had become had become fluent in Russian, um, and later published uh, a translation of Cossack songs in English. So this table linen is is most likely connected to her, you know, her her marriage uh, and her the influence uh, that her husband and his circle had on her during that time. Uh, some other really interesting objects. Um, these are all ecclesiastical stoles. Um, so they would have been worn by clergymen around the back of the neck, hanging on the front of the body. Um, the two red ones are very long. They would have hung very low, um, like around the hips. The other two appear that they might have been cut and re-sewn because they're very small and they would, they would be pretty short around the neck. Um, but there's some interesting pieces, church pieces. Yeah, um, this one is a bit of a puzzle, but um, the is, the Dickinsons certainly were um, sort of rock-ribbed Calvinists, but uh, both Susan Dickinson and Martha Dickinson Bianchi sort of flirted a little bit with Catholicism, uh, especially, and they were really attracted to, to these kind of liturgical forms. One of Martha Dickinson's uh, volumes of poetry is titled The Cathedral. And the way that book is organized is by the architectural elements that she observed in a cathedral as the sort of the title of the poem and then the theme. Um, but anyway, this, this interest in Catholicism wasn't really, they weren't alone in this. That was something uh, pretty that, that uh, congregational ministers had to um, had had to deal with in the late 19th century, especially the 1870s and 80s. Two of the Dickinson family's congregational minister friends even wrote books about 
you know, how to how to deal with this. Um, it's and it's kind of interesting also, Martha Dickinson Bianchi being a, a novelist, in her novels, she kind of pits this sort of wholesome New England congregationalism uh, against uh, sort of a declining, almost decaying English, uh, European Catholicism. So that's a theme that runs pretty consistently throughout her novels. So we'll move into um, a couple pieces of clothing. Um, so these two pieces, this bodice and skirt, um, we don't know the the timing of these. Um, I'm not a textile historian, so I'm not able to date them. To me, they look 19th century. I think the latest they could be is probably 1900. Um, but that is something that I think a textile historian would be able to identify pretty easily. Um, but the interesting thing about this that I wanted to call attention to was that um, when we were going through all of our 70 plus boxes of textiles, um, we actually came across these in two very separate boxes, um, actually, actually I think a couple months apart, um, and we were able to reunite them because we recognized the same wheat embroidery that you can see at the bottom there. Um, so that's why kind of the, the beauty of why this project was so important that we went through the entire collection all at one time, the same staff, mm -hmm. so that we were able to reconnect and reassociate these objects. Otherwise, if we had only done one box at a time and the staff had changed, um, it might have taken a long time to reunite these. But now we have a full costume here, a full outfit, which is really exciting. Here's another lovely dress. Um, this one is, uh, we think, circa 1910. Uh, this was made by the famous Italian fashion house Fortuny. Um, he was very famous for this design. This Delphos gown was very popular during that time. Um, and his signature was, as you can see in the middle picture, um, very fine pleating in silk. Um, he actually designed this style of pleating and actually um, it was known that you couldn't wash the garment because the pleating would come out. You would actually have to send it back to him to get either repleated or to get um, properly laundered. Um, so this piece here, we think, uh, was is associated with Martha Dickinson Bianchi. Um, and I just like to brag that there is a similar, if not the same dress at the Met, the Met <laughs> costume oh, collection. So that's very exciting. <laughs> Uh, these two pieces are 19th century black lace shawls. Um, it's hard to tell in these pictures, but they're actually almost 10 feet wide. They're very large. Um, so they would completely wrap a person. Um, and these, you know, would have been high fashion in the 19th century. Um, we don't really know much more about them. We don't know who may have worn these or for what occasion. Um, so that will be really exciting to identify, but they're in surprisingly good condition. Um, and they're just really beautiful to see all the intricate lace work. Uh, these two objects, or three objects, um, originally posed quite a mystery to us. Uh, the piece on the left, those are two sleeves. Um, and what you see at the top is the cotton lining, and then lower down, it's uh, covered with its dress silk on top. And then the blouse on the right is also missing some of its silk on the sleeve. Um, we believe these are, you know, mid 19th century pieces. Again, a textile historian will help us properly date these. Uh, but when we came across these, we just thought, hmm, well, no one's wearing these anymore. You know, these maybe they were out of style, and and but why would they? Why would they be saved? Why would the family save these pieces? Um, so we'll come back to these in just a moment. Uh, but I wanted to share some of our quilt blocks. Um, we came across these. Um, there's kind of three different forms. There's you can see two here. So that we have squares and hexagons. Um, and we we covered these in our um, paper conservation program. So if you want to hear more about these, I suggest you um, watch that program as well, because there is um, some paper associated with these objects. Um, but I wanted to focus on the, the textiles. You can see it's a whole range of colors, patterns, all different types of materials. Um, and this is a quilt in progress. It hasn't been finished. It's barely been started. <laughs> um, but you can see all the different types of, of um, fabrics that are available in this, which is really exciting to see 
kind of the variety. And we are guessing that this is a Dickinson quilt, an unfinished Dickinson quilt um, in some of the paper backing. We've seen the name Dickinson several times. I think we've also seen Lavinia and Gibbs. So it does put these um, quilt blocks in this house, which is really exciting. So I'm gonna take us back to those previous objects that we just saw. And we were able to identify that the fabrics of the dress silks um, of those previous pieces of clothing were actually cut up and used in these quilts. Um, so the piece on the left is a very tiny, tiny triangle um, that they started a quilt square. That's as much as we have. I think they gave up because it was too small. That's why I would have given up. <laughs> um, and then the pieces on the right, you can see that they used both of those. Um, fabrics from the, the previous objects, which is just really exciting that we were able to identify that. And it shows that, you know, this family saved everything because they they saved, they even saved the, the physical objects themselves. They could have just cut all of the silk out and just saved that, but they didn't. They kept the whole blouse, which I think is really fascinating. Um, and so these two we were able to identify because those are pretty distinct patterns. Um, but there is a chance that we will be able to identify more fabrics. Mm -hmm. the, the, you know, kind of deeper we look into all of our textiles. And the last big highlight is um, kind of tonight's star. Uh, this is the Paisley shawl that is associated with Emily Dickinson. Um, I will just note that this is over 10 feet long. So our actually our photography setup during this project uh, couldn't capture the whole thing. That's why there's only uh, fringe on the left side. Um, it does extend all the way. We just couldn't capture it because it's such a massive object. Um, but this is a beautiful shawl. It's been displayed on Dickinson's bed in the homestead for many years. Um, we think that it's probably from around 1860. Um, it's got this really beautifully defined paisley pattern on it, as well as that really bright, colorful uh, border and fringe. And that's kind of how we're able to, to date um, shawls like this is from that border. Um, and it's just a really beautiful piece. And we're going to hear more about it from Lise. Um, so Lise Shapiro Sanders is professor of English literature and cultural studies at Hampshire College. Her books include Consuming Fantasies, Labor, Leisure, and the London Shop Girl, 1880 to 1920, Bodies and Lives in Victorian England, Science, Sexuality, and the Affliction of Being Female, co-authored with Pamela Case Stone, Embodied Utopias, Gender, Social Change, and the Modern Metropolis, co-edited with Amy Bingaman and Rebecca Zorak, and a critical edition of Millicent Garrett Fawcett's 1875 novel, Janet Doncaster. She is a member of the Feminist Theory Editorial Collective and is currently a work on a new book on women, modernity, and romance in the 1920s. So Lise, take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and it's just wonderful to see a, a sampling of the incredible textiles in the collection. So um, as uh, Megan said, um, I was inspired by this particular shawl to undertake a research project that spanned several years. So it actually traces back to two events. One is in 2016, I came to the museum with my class a uh, woman and poet and saw again, the shawl on the bed in Dickinson's bedroom. Um, and then in 2019, uh, several colleagues, Jane Garrity and Celia Marshik invited me to contribute to a special issue of a journal called the English Language Notes on the subject of fashion's borders. So given the topic, I immediately recalled some research in on shawls in British literature and culture that I had undertaken uh, a number of years ago and thought that this would be a perfect opportunity to consider this particular shawl as a material object with global historical significance. So after two years of research, the bulk of which was completed during the museum's uh, temporary closure and during the pandemic, my article, Emily Dickinson Shawl, Textiles Across Borders, was published in December of 2022. Um, and just to note, I am in no way a Dickinson expert, but very much an enthusiast. Um, and it's been such a pleasure to have the opportunity to work in the collection for the first time. 
So since then, as you will hear more about, several other shawls have been identified in the museum's collections. And I'd be happy to talk later about how my argument might have changed as a result of knowing about these additional shawls and the broad range of textiles in the collection. But for now, these discoveries underscore that scholarly research is always changing and in process, even after publication. So let me just advance, there we go. So I'll read the top quote, which is from Martha Dickens Bianchi, describing Emily and her sister Lavinia in their youth. For best, they wore gay muslins in summer and bright merinos in winter. Their new bonnets and shawls were events to date by. So uh, Martha Dickinson Bianchi, or Maddie, was Emily Dickinson's niece, and her lively 1932 memoir, Emily Dickinson Face to Face, from which the above quotation is drawn, definitely captures the lives and character of the Dickinson family circle. So if you haven't uh, already read it, I highly recommend it in the new edition. So as you've seen, this is an image taken of the uh, shawl associated with Emily Dickinson that for many years graced the bed in her bedroom in the homestead. Um, Jane graciously invited me in uh, to take photographs of the shawl in situ before it went into collection storage. So as Megan mentioned, it's over 10 feet long, 125 inches long by 64 and a half inches wide. It's made of a fine, soft wool. Uh, and you can see this intricate pattern of organic form, uh, forms in shades of red, orange, yellow, blue, and green with accents of black, brown, ecru, and beige, and an ivory colored center that measures 30 inches in length by 13 and a half inches in width and is framed with a border of stylized leaves. A little difficult to see in this image. So it was folded in half. It, it effectively covered the sleigh bed in Emily's bedroom at the homestead. Uh, where it was housed for many years, and its rectangular shape and size identify it as a long shawl, so termed to distinguish it from the square shawls and narrower scarves that were popular during the same period. Although the provenance of the shawl is unknown, Emily Dickinson may have worn this shawl several decades before her death. As Deneen Wardrop notes in her 2009 book, Emily Dickinson and the Labor of Clothing, such shawls were the rage in fashion in the United States and Britain in the mid 19th century. Worn for warmth as well as for fashion, shawls had an enduring role as accessories to 19th century gowns as they complemented both the empire and hourglass silhouettes, which together shaped women's fashions from the late 18th through the mid 19th centuries. There are in fact multiple shawls in the Dickinson archives. And you'll see here an image of the blue green cotton worsted crocheted shawl held at the Houghton Library at Harvard, uh, which was likely made by Dickinson's cousin, Louisa Norcross in around 1860 and may have been worn by Dickinson when she met her literary mentor, Thomas Wentworth Higginson in August, 1870. In addition, Susan Dickinson or Sue uh, is described as wearing a quote, scarlet India shawl in 1881. This may well be the one, well, this may well be one of the shawls currently in the museum's collection. So because I'm not a textile historian, to assist me uh, in this work, I consulted with Lynn Z. Bassett, who specializes in the historic costume and textiles of New England. And Lynn Bassett confirmed that this shawl was made in Europe on a power loom as indicated by the cut Wes on the back of the shawl. And this is a reverse image um, so that you can see that the Wes are cut uh, indicating a machine made um, shawl. So given its size and pattern, Bassett dates the shawl to between 1855 and 1865 and notes that although it's impossible to definitively identify its country of origin, it's possible that the shawl was made in Norwich, England, judging from the design and the quality of the leaf. Dickinson's contemporaries referred to this type of textile as an India shawl. The choice of modifier, framing the shawl as from or associated with India, suggests its status as a visual and tactile remnant of the material history of colonialism and its legacy for 19th century consumer practices in Britain, the US, and across the globe. 
India shawls appear frequently in sources ranging from advertisements to fashion columns to fiction, but as often as not, the modifier India is emptied of its meaning and extrapolated by association to shawls made elsewhere. The shawl's true site of origin is thus obscured by the process through which India comes to bear the weight of the commodification of Orientalism for a market of female consumers. In the realm of fashion, imperial commodity exchange networks provided both the aesthetic influences and practical structures through which Orientalism was produced, distributed, marketed, and consumed. Kashmiri shawls, which had been made for centuries from the fine hair of Himalayan mountain goats and worn by male members of the Mughal imperial court, circulated widely in the late 18th and 19th centuries via both formal and informal trade routes influencing textile production in England and Scotland, where the town of Paisley near Glasgow lent its name to a westernized version of the buta or bote, the bent inverted teardrop shaped Kashmiri design that forms the basis of the pattern. Scholars have traced the ways in which shawl design and production in Kashmir and India were influenced by the demands of the market. In the global marketplace, 19th century designs were continually adapted and modified, not only by European travelers, but by the Kashmiri weavers themselves. So this is an image of um, a stereo card or stereograph in the Library of Congress collection, uh, and is described as humble shawl weavers at Kashmir, patiently creating wonderful harmonies of line and color. So an interesting um, uh, paper photographic artifact complement this work. Dickinson scholars have described her multicolored shawl as having a pattern with a, quote, Asian aspect that indicates, quote, Eastern influence. But given the av availability of European machine-made shawls on the global market in the 1850s and 1860s, Dickinson would have had easier access to a European rather than an Indian shawl. So building on earlier texts, including UMass professor Suzanne Daly's 2011 book, The Empire Inside, Indian Commodities and Victorian Domestic Novels, recent scholarship such as Suchitra Choudhury's Textile Orientalisms has provided new insights into the literary and cultural significance of both Kashmiri and European made, and in Choudhury's case, specifically British shawls. Uh, in reflecting on the project of the article, which focused on the shawl and some more literary uh, readings of the shawl in the context of Dickinson's work um, and in conversation with Megan, I thought about shawls as how they, in terms of how they appear in 19th century portraiture. So they appear in a wide variety of 19th century historical and literary sources, as well as in paintings and photographs. So the next several slides demonstrate the enduring, enduring significance of both Kashmiri shawls and the European-made Paisley shawl. These are two early 19th century paintings of Josephine de Beauharnais, or of the Empress Josephine, first wife of Napoleon Bonaparte, um, paintings by Antoine Jean Gros on the left and Pierre Paul Proudhon on the right from 1808 to 1809. And as uh, French and British designs modeled on Kashmiri originals began to flood the market. Questions of authenticity shaped discourses around the shawl as a form of fashion. Michelle Maskell situates these discourses within historically contingent cycles of appropriating and renaming Asian handcrafted textiles for home markets. And I've included a somewhat longer quote below. First, Europeans tried to monopolize the collection of commodities in Asia and their transportation home. Second, Europeans manufactured import substitutes which copied the commodities from Chinese porcelain to Kashmiri shawls. Third, Europeans incorporated both the imports and their European made copies into the Western European and Euro-American fashion cycles for chinoiserie, Orientalism, Japonisme, quote unquote, Indian style, and so on. Kashmiri shawls serve as a material vector to trace persistent patterns within the historical context of one such cycle. And as shown from a couple of uh, mid-century examples, we see the shawl adapted and revealed in paintings of on the left, Lady with the Greyhound by Daniel Saint, and on the right, William Holman Hunt's portrait of Fanny Holman Hunt. Um, and certainly in that 
uh, right hand image, you can see the vibrant colors of the paisley shawl that she wears. So although the cashmere shawl had initially become popular in Europe in the late 18th century, as employees of the British East India Company brought home shawls as gifts for family members, both Indian and European shawls continued to be in vogue until the 1870s, with brief resurgences in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. An unsigned 1899 article in Harper's Bazaar entitled The Shawl, Its Passing and Renaissance takes pains to point out the shawl's status as a precious possession whose value may be passed on to subsequent generations. Quote, fashion, which moves in circles, will bring again into use the neglected long or square, single or double shawl, for this persistent garment refuses to be permanently banished from my lady's wardrobe. And you can see a detail of a Paisley shawl in the uh, University of Illinois Spurlock Museum's collection from circa 1850 here. So having researched this one uh, individual shawl in the Emily Dickinson Museum's collection, I did some thinking about shawls in other museums' collections uh, and came across a portrait of a woman, an albumin print from 1854 in the Victorian Albert collection, uh, M.L. Cole wearing a Paisley shawl sitting outside a house. And although I have not yet delved into um, the possibilities of further research, one might wonder uh, who is M.L. Cole and what is her history? What is the provenance and history of this particular shawl? How does this image intersect with the history of fashion, of photography? Um, and surely there are many other questions to ask of this image, which I find quite fascinating in part because of its uh, level of detail, including the hairstyle and the size of skirt and shape of gown of that period. Another approach to researching shawls and other textiles in museum collections would be to start with well-known individuals associated with particular garments. So on the left, you'll see a silk, lace, and linen shawl given to Harriet Tubman by Queen Victoria in 1897. Um, and, and worn by the well-known abolitionist um, and reformer, and now in the uh, collection of the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. On the right, the suffragist Susan B. Anthony's red silk shawl uh, in the National American Woman Suffrage Association's collection of the Smithsonian National Museum of American History. And um, uh, to think about the ways in which these shawls became iconic and associated with their wearers and the work of them done by their wearers in public um, in, in their efforts at reform, it would be another kind of fascinating project. So to think about the root of Dickinson's shawl, um, it inspires us to ask certain questions about how a shawl that was likely made in Europe ended up uh, here in Amherst, Massachusetts. The increasing number of shawls made in England and Scotland, especially in Norwich, Edinburgh, and Paisley, and in France, due in part to the invention of the Jacquard loom and the expansion of the trade in the 1820s and 1830s, resulted in an extensive global trade in European machine-made shawls, many of which were exported to the United States and advertised in magazines such as Godey's Ladies' Book and Harper's Bazaar. Uh, and you can see in the image here, this is a late 19th century Austrian um, version of a Jacquard loom, which has punch cards that mechanize the process, um, making it much easier and quicker to create um, shawls according to a given pattern. So uh, unsurprisingly, department stores capitalized on the global fashion for shawls, recognizing the garment's cultural significance as a symbol of wealth and status, as well as its role as a marker of trends in the textile trade. And so stores like Jordan Marsh, the Boston uh, department store founded in 1851, which began by selling linen and dry goods to wholesale clients uh, and other stores uh, began advertising imported textiles as well as American made goods. If you've watched part one of this series, you'll remember that Nan Wolverton mentioned several stores that the Dickinson family patronized during this period. Among them, A.A. Vantine and Company on Broadway and 18th Street in New York, described in the late 19th century advertisements as Orientalists and Jewelers, and W. and J. Sloan in New York. 
uh, if Dickinson Shaw was acquired in uh, Boston or New York or another major city, it may have been purchased at a store of this kind, though, of course, it could also have been purchased at a smaller shop or received as a gift. Further research into the history of these stores might lead to additional information about the provenance of textiles in the museum's collections. As the silhouette narrowed and the bustle came into fashion in the 1870s, the shawl declined in popularity. Although as historians have noted, the shawl industry had already been affected by political and economic circumstances. Famine destroyed a significant percentage of the population of weavers in Kashmir and workers in Paisley and other British and European shawl manufacturing centers were affected by trade declines as well as the increasing use of power looms. Yet even as they became less fashionable, shawls were often retained within families and handed down as heirlooms, as was the case, or appears to have been the case, with Dickinson's shawl. And I really love this image that Megan found of um, the Paisley shawl, a painting from 1910, uh, which evokes the way the shawl envelops the body of its wearer. So the shawl could also very well be repurposed as a decorative object in later years. Subsequent generations of women might inherit an India or Paisley shawl from their grandmothers and transform it into a cloak. And on the right, you can see an image from Harper's Bazaar from 1881 with um, uh, the caption, always in order is a cloak made of an India shawl. Interestingly, there were uh, uh, patterns that didn't involve cutting the shawl so that it could be sewn into a cloak, but the structure of the shawl could be maintained and it could be eventually unpicked um, and used in its original form. Or it might be repurposed as a design element. Here and there, one finds an artistic arrangement of an old Paisley shawl, wheedled from her grandmother, perhaps. This is Grace Alexander Fowler in an article on studio life among women artists from 1905. Period debates over commodification and appropriation came to exemplify larger concerns about authenticity and reproduction. Such concerns were central to the rationale offered as an explanation for the precipitous fall in popularity of the shawl in the 1870s. Workers in the shawl weaving industries in Kashmir as well as in Europe were simultaneously seen as artisans, masters of trade and design, but also at risk of being eclipsed and outmoded. By the late 19th century, these elements of industrial textile production had come together in another form of appropriation. Roller printed cotton textiles with the Paisley design were being mass produced in Britain alongside woven shawls. Indian producers responded by incorporating Paisley designs into their own hand block printed fabrics, forming a cycle of innovation, appropriation and commodification. And although the text is slightly too small to read, this is an advertisement for Lord and Taylor in Harper's Bazaar from 1876 describing the range of prices for real India uh, and striped India shawls, among others. Concerns about design modification and appropriation did not preclude fashion magazines from extolling the virtues of the Paisley pattern. By 1910, a series of Harper's Bazaar articles showcased the appeal of Paisley when used as a surface level pattern, transposed to silk or cotton or as a fashionable border to a solid color gown, a displacement of the original meaning of the Paisley shawl. As a result, the meanings of Paisley transformed from the industrial city of Paisley to the woven shawl to the design itself, in the process rendering the warp and the weft the work of the weaver less visible and less tactile. And this is an article from 1910 uh, by Marie Oliver called Outdoor Fashions. One of the wonderful aspects of this project, in addition to textile research, involved a lot of periodical research, which is another component of what I love to do, spend time with old magazines. So this brings me to some conclusions. Modifications to shawl design over the course of the 19th century demonstrate the forms of exchange occurring as a result of demand for new patterns and new fashions. In this way, the shawl, both this particular shawl and the larger set of textiles it represents, enters into 19th century and modern narratives of authenticity and imitation, the original and the copy, and the appropriation of colonial products for Western consumption. Yet it also complicates those narratives, underscoring the multi-directional flow of global commodities across cultural, national, and imperial borders. 
It invites us to read through the patterns we assume to be conventional and look closely at the traces of history embedded in everyday acts of production and consumption, even or perhaps especially those associated with the seemingly trivial, yet actually quite significant discourses centered on fashionable garments. So uh, just this is a brief summary of the vast number of sources I found tremendously helpful. Um, just a select reading list I'd recommend uh, and some image credits. And because those are going by so quickly, I would be happy to share any further references with you. Feel free uh, to email me and my address is here. I've also provided the bibliographic citation for the article, which I'd be happy to share as well. Uh, but I just wanted to give my warm thanks to Megan Ramsey, Brooks, Steinhauser, and Jane Walt for the opportunity to do this research and speak about it with you today. Thank you, Lise, for such a tremendous multidimensional look at this one object uh, from the Emily Dickinson Museums now. Uh, well, larger collection than we thought of it. But, um, and, you know, just being able to place that object within a, a social and cultural and economic context really, of course, gives it uh, additional meaning in addition to um, what the individual owner can wear, what their own sort of emotional and practical connection to it might be. Um, you, uh, invited us to ask this question. <laughs> um, how would your argument have changed had you known about the shawls that uh, were, were found finally during this cataloging project? That the project that started, I think, right about the time that you were um, taking a look at that, that first shawl. I think that's right. Um, I think it's a wonderful question, and I've been pondering how that yeah. argument would have changed. I think, um, first and foremost, I think I would have referenced the shawl as one of several. So to make some comparisons and distinctions between them, and Megan and I did some of that together, looking at these several shawls um, in, uh, in the warehouse. But to be able to spend some time thinking about distinctions in type of weave and um, uh, choices of color, age of the particular shawls. Um, there are a number of specialized books on um, both Kashmiri shawls and on um, uh, Paisley shawls produced in Paisley and Norwich that are also helpful in uh, enabling us to know more about the range of shawls. I'm quite intrigued by uh, the definition or description of the scarlet India shawl worn by Sue. And so there is a shawl that has more of a scarlet center or um, distinct from the white center of this shawl. So, uh, but again, it leads down a path of uh, curious speculation. I have also spent some time since writing the article looking more closely at the letters and it's a really valuable concordance to the letters, which does reference a number of shawls, including shawls that uh, Lavinia received as a gift that Emily acknowledged in thanks um, in a letter to Austin. So I'm intrigued by these references. Mm -hmm. And although part of the work that I didn't discuss today that I did in the article was to think about Dickinson's own references to shawls in her poetry, um, to think about the shawl as an everyday garment that is both so central to women's lives in the 19th century and is also um, uh, so everyday is to not be mentioned or recorded yeah. in the same way that, you know, the piano or paintings or other objects might be. So it doesn't appear in the inventories, for example. Um, anyway, there's much more research to do. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> you know the the everyday the everydayness of it. I just loved the the two poems that you featured in your article. The one is one of my favorites. I tie my hat, I crease my shawl. Life's little duties do precisely as the very least were infinite to me. And then, like the other extreme, is the the other one that you selected. Mm -hmm. The first line: His mind like fabrics of the East, displayed to the despair of everyone, but here and there, uh, and humble purchaser. So it, it seems like you've sort of bookended the theme of your 
of your whole article. Absolutely. Yeah. And wonderful research um, done by Kristen Miller and, and others on the references to fabrics um, in the poems. There's so much of a wealth of detail there. It's worth the exploring. Yeah. So Megan, um, Lise has given us an extraordinary example of what your whole purpose of cataloging this collection has been. So what are you what are what else are you hope, hoping to see in the future as yeah. you approaches to research? I'm I'm fascinated to to think more about, you know, had we done our cataloging project five years ago, how that would affect your research and how it's just going to affect research now moving forward now that we've completed this cataloging project. Um, but I'm also wondering, how have you accessed other collections um, with your research? Wonderful question. Um, and so I think knowing that the museum has done this cataloging work, I would absolutely be delighted to craft a course that would have a unit where we might spend some time looking at particular um, textiles in the collection, for example. I did teach a course on fashion history um, and fashion media at Amherst College, and I would love to continue to explore that material history through um, garments and textiles in this case. Um, in conversation with you, I learned that the museum has a, a collection of doll clothing that I have become particularly fascinated with <laughs> that is well worth further exploration. So um, it just seems like there are tremendous opportunities and uh, also opportunities to really use that collective practice of research and conversation as a collaborative model for, um, for research in and outside the classroom. So to be able to work with students in discerning some of this material history. Uh, is really a fascinating opportunity. So one of the collections I've worked um, briefly in uh, with students is Historic Northampton. A number of years ago, I was co-teaching a course in women's history with Susan Tracy at Hampshire College. And we brought students to the museum to think about and in fact write an object analysis of a particular garment or um, uh, other item that they identified in the collection. And that was a tremendous opportunity. They have a fabulous garment collection. They absolutely, absolutely do. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah. But the, it, that's so interesting that you would bring that into the classroom because one of the things you have to do in your research and we have to do and that you will introduce students to is um, this sort of uh, complex interdisciplinary approach where you've got to tap so many different um, areas of expertise uh, for a full picture. And that's, um, how, how did you approach this whole project knowing that that's how you would go about it? Uh, that's a great question. I, I mean, there's something sort of fundamental in my training, particularly my long association with Hampshire, um, such that interdisciplinarity feels very comfortable to me. I'm quite, um, I really embrace the opportunity to work in an interdisciplinary way. But it also was the first time I really reached out to a textile historian mm -hmm. to um, to gain the kind of knowledge and expertise from someone who really can evaluate this material um, uh, with that long history and extensive knowledge. So, and I think I keep having to remind myself that I am a literary scholar because much of the work I have done over the years has been in cultural and social history, merges on art history um, and, uh, and many other fields. And I've become, I would say in the last five or 10 years, especially interested in archives and museum collections as an opportunity to you know, bolster my own research into be it fiction or film, another area I work within, but also as a way to spark students' interest yeah. because it's such, a, it's such a wonderful opportunity when you have the chance to hold um, an object in your hands and figure out what you can learn from a close analysis of that object. Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Man. So I to... yeah, I wonder if we should do a close analysis of all three of our shawls, um, <laughs> since we've been talking about them so much. So, so 
So this is again uh, the shawl associated with Dickinson that was on display on her uh, bed here in the homestead for so long. Um, just wanted to bring that back since that's what we've heard about for the last 20 minutes. Um, that those just very defined, distinct um, pattern there surrounding that pretty small off-white center and the very vibrant colors there on the border with the fringe. Uh, and here's another um, close-up of that and then another um, image of that underside to see that cut weft mm -hmm. um, to see how really how this was um, woven. And here is another shawl that we discovered during our cataloging project. Um, this one is also, you know, kind of a, a similar color pattern, that orangey, reddish, rusty color. Uh, but the center is, is very different. We have this yellow and an X shape. Um, and this has kind of a more muted uh, pattern to it. It doesn't have that really defined kind of um, paisley shape. You can still see the paisley shapes, but it's it's just very different than the, the other shawl. Mm -hmm. And the um, the difference in color on the edges, is that, do you think that's fading or do you think that's different I, weaving? I think it's different weaving. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that very center um, horizontal band is just, I, I think is just a different um, color that was woven into that section there. And this is zoomed in on that border and the underside again. So you can see on this border, it's a, it's more muted colors than the other one, rather than that bright green and blue. Um, there is still, you know, a pattern on the border um, and still has its own fringe, which is really cool. Um, in the very minor amount of research I've done, I think this one is about 10 years older than the um, shawl that we have associated with Dickinson. Um, so that that's also very interesting to think about. If this is if that one is from you know 1860 ish, this one might be from 1850. Um, so you know that might expand or maybe limit who might have been associated with this shawl. That's another big question for us. And the third shawl is this piece here with a much larger um, center area. Again, some paisley shapes repeating on the edge. Um, and then the border is very small on this one, just blocks of color, which is good. Yeah, the, the very narrow too. Very yes. narrow and, and no pattern. It's just blocks of color. The fringe is almost completely missing. Um, and then again, from some very limited research, we think this one is possibly even older, maybe around 1845. <laughs> So that would put Dickinson herself around, you know, 14, 15 years old. Would and her mother is yes, in the yes, picture. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the thing is, yeah, we have many Dickinson women that could be associated with these shawls. Um, so I, I it's this to me opens up a lot of a lot more questions, um, but it's really exciting to think about. Um, and then the last piece I wanted to call attention to um is this border piece um that uh, at least you talked about repurposing mm -hmm. that these shawls, you know, as they kind of went out of style, they, they could have been repurposed. Mm -hmm. um, so possibly that's what happened here. Uh, so this is a, a square shape and actually the, the left and lower frame is sewn in one direction and the right and the top frame is actually upside down and sewn in the other direction. <laughs> um, so uh, who knows what this is supposed to be. This is a quite a mystery object. Um, but it does look like it could be part of a border of a Paisley shawl. Mm -hmm. And here's all three shawls together. So you can see some um, similarities and some differences. And just a, just a reminder that um, the, the photographic setup is cutting off the, <laughs> yes. the end of each the other so, full size shawls just and not full size symmetrical. image yes <laughs> and what's interesting about these two is they are they're distinct in certain ways but they're also very similar in other ways you've looked through a number of the um books that archive different shawls in in collections and there are shawls that are primarily white with red borders for example or we saw a fully red plain center with edging in a pattern so it's really interesting to me that that there are these 
um, subcategories of types of shawls, and they clearly circulated um, under certain kinds of discourses mm -hmm. in the period, right? So that the term paisley becomes identified with this particular pattern, mm -hmm. but that shawls, which are referred to very generally, could mean anything from the black lace shawls mm -hmm. that you showed to the blue worsted shawl to any number of other shawls. Um, so again, this is a really rich area for, re for research, both in digital collections, more and more um, uh, museums and collections have digitized photographs of their shawls, but also in the, uh, the scholarship. And I think that brings us to um, the big collections announcement. Megan. So um, all of this, all of this work, all of these images that you see here, all of the three years of cataloging um, has kind of come to a head. And we are very excited to announce that our database is live and public. Um, so all of you right now can actually go on our website and browse our entire 8,000 plus collection. Um, and if all of you do that right now, then we'll know whether it, it'll crash. <laughs> Um, so I'm happy to to go through that with all of you guys. Um, oh, my slide's a little messed up, um, but we're going to share this in the chat. It's the link to our database. Um, you can find it through our website. And if you go on our website, emilydickinsonmuseum.org, if you hover on About the Museum and click on the collection, it will take you to um, the web page on the right which um, has kind of some basic information about the collections, some frequently asked questions, where can I find this and, and who can I ask for what? Um, but the, the green box there, the search the collection is where you'll wanna go to actually um, see our database. And that will bring you to this page here. And this is our landing page. It gives you a brief overview. It lets you know that this is a working database. It will constantly be updated as we learn things. Um, it gives you an email address to um, contact us if you have questions, and then it gives you some brief tips about searching. You can see on the left, there is a toolbar. Uh, we are currently on the home page, but there is a keyword search, advanced search, random images, and then all objects. If you want to browse all 8,000 plus objects, um, you can do that. <laughs> So if you're interested in searching, um, let's say you're interested in seeing what, our dr what dresses we have in the collection. Um, if you go to our keyword search and type in dress in the search bar, you'll come up with 139 results because that's searching literally all available data. So you can see there's a doll on there because the doll is wearing a dress. And there's also a photograph because a woman is wearing a dress in the picture. Um, so if you're actually only interested in the actual dresses of the collection, you'll want to go into advanced search and you'll want to go to the object name. So you can see there's 43 dresses in the collection. Um, so searching, you'll, you'll play around with some of our um, tips for searching. So if we're interested in the reproduction white dress, um, this is what the object record um, will look like when you click on that. So you can see that we have lots of images on the left. We have the object name, object number, which is its unique identifying number, kind of like a social security number. This is the only object with that number. We have a physical description of the object. We have dimensions, and then we also include whether or not it is on uh, public display. So this piece here is the reproduction white dress. It is on exhibit uh, in Emily Dickinson's bedroom in the homestead. So if, if you're excited to see this dress up close and personal, you can click on the images. They will um, pop up in a new window so you can see them a bit bigger. Um, and even though you can see this dress today, tomorrow, on public display here in the homestead, um, it's really exciting to look through some of the pictures because we took pictures from all different angles. Um, you know, we did the underside of plates. We did the backside of pieces of furniture. And then for this piece here, the reproduction dress, uh, on the right is a label sewn on the inside of the dress, so no one ever gets to see this, uh, but it is a nice label um, identifying that this was a reproduction of Emily Dickinson's dress made in 1999 by Adrienne St. Pierre. Um, so there's a lot of um, more behind the scenes, I guess, that you can find uh, in our photographs. If we go back to that object record, uh, in the top right corner, you can see there are two links. We have email to a friend and send us feedback. 
If you click on either of those, a new pop-up window will come up. An email to a friend is just that. It will email that specific catalog record to whoever you want, your friend, your boss, your neighbor, even yourself. You can just email it to yourself if you want to um, keep track of that specific object record. And then send us feedback actually sends the museum an email. If you have more information about an object that you'd like to share, or if you have a specific question about that object, um, this will send the museum an email and we will get back to you. So we want this to feel like, you know, we're giving you this, this database, but we also know that you all have a lot of information yourselves and you also have a lot of questions. So we want it to feel um, like there is some, some feedback going back and forth. Uh, and the last thing I'll talk about is random images. Um, this I think is the best place to start if you don't know what you're looking for on the database. This is a really fun way to use the database. Um, it will just grab random records from across the database. Um, it changes every time you click on it, but it brings together all sorts of different objects. So you can see uh, ceramics, textiles, furniture, photographs, literally random records from across the database. And it's a really cool way to make connections that there is no other way to search the database and come up with these results. It really is just random. Um, and then from here, you can click on the names or the images of those objects and it will take you to the object records. But just remember, you can never return to your original random images. It's always new every time, which is part of the fun. <laughs> Off. Um, but yes, so come visit our database now that it's live. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Um, this is a new resource for us, a new, a brand new thing. So um, if it breaks, please let us know. <laughs> and if you find something amazing and you're really excited about it, we also want to hear about that as well. We're, we're just as excited as all of you are. So let us know. So congratulations, Megan. This is a tremendous uh, accomplishment in, I mean, it, we're, we're still celebrating the museum's 20th anniversary this year. And so this is a remarkable thing to be able to release in this important year. Um, and thinking also about this, this collection that is more than 20 years old. It's, you know, when back when Mary Hampson's will was going through probate court. That's going back 30 years. So, um, so we are we are very pleased to now have freed the collection uh, for for more exploration and research. Um, so let's see. I think we have a few minutes for some questions. Um, okay. So there is one. Do we know if Emily Dickinson knit? Uh, and I know that Emily Dickinson sewed. I know she darned socks. I know she mended. Do you know what she did? I don't know. That's an excellent question. I remember reading a reference to darning socks. Yeah. So I would have yeah. said yes, that, but I know. Yeah. But knitting, I'm yes. not sure. I, you know, after all this time, why don't I know? <laughs> <laughs> Great question. <All> right. <laughs> um, Okay, there is one, uh, this, oh, this is a great question for you, Lise, I think. Were household textiles respected in their time as artistry? What a wonderful question. Um, and again, I think a textile historian would be able to tell us more about specific kinds of textiles, but I would say my, my assumption is that on the one hand, Yes, in that there was embroidery in the case of, for example, a fire screen, right? That there yeah. are these beautiful um, uh, ways of implementing art and craft in textile form. And I think given that that was women's work that was associated with women in the 19th century and was valued, um, yes, they were recognized as artistic practice and, and a craft form that needed expertise. On the other hand, there are also so many everyday objects that were um, that are lost to us today, right? Completely so, utilitarian, also completely yeah. utilitarian. Although looking at the embroidered D on the linens, right, we probably spend too little time today 
um, making our everyday linens as beautiful as those were, right? So I think that's a wonderful question for further consideration, particularly for people today who are inclined toward working with textiles as art and craft. Mm -hmm. craft. We, we also have at least one sampler in our collection uh, that was um, just a, a discipline, a training that, uh, that girls needed to uh, master. Uh, in their youth. So that's a, another example of craft and artistry and, well, and sort of practical training. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's see. So uh, are there any other quilts or in process quilts in the collection? Or do you think uh, maybe another addition to that is um, do you think what we saw was one quilt? I think those were three different quilts. So I think the hexagons were one quilt, and there was the squares, and then there's that tiny little triangle part of a diamond, and that's all we have is those two pieces. Um, so I think I think there were three in process um, quilts, and the the squares we have a ton of the individual squares, and then the hexagons we have a lot of like the flowers where it's one with surrounded by six. Um, so they're at different stages, which I even find really interesting and. Um, there's, I think there's so much research potential in those of, can we date the paper? Can we figure out the handwriting on the paper to figure out timing? Can we figure out where more of the textiles themselves came from? Where different shapes of quilts popular during different times? Like the, the triangle that turned into the diamond, was that really popular during one time? And then nobody did it again because it was too small. <laughs> It's that it's fascinating about <laughs> yeah. We may have um, quilting historians in the audience, but I I have a colleague who's um, working on 20th century knitting patterns and is uh, uh, developing a crowdsourcing project to try to discern some of the um, information that can be gleaned from these patterns. So I'm also thinking the many instances in 19th century fiction of references to different forms of sewing. Um, and so conduct guides or other kinds of manuals in the 19th century might be another mm -hmm. place to look for information on um, quilting. So there's a kind of parallel text-based research one mm -hmm. can do in conjunction with the textile research. And of course, scholars have reminded us that text and textile are related words, yes, right? right? So they, it really unites that mm -hmm. practice. At least. Mm -hmm. I know there's a, at least one other object, and I don't know whether it's uh, classified as a quilt or a hanging or whatever it is. And it's a um, it's a dark velvet background, you know that one, with large, sort of large chain stitch embroidery. Yep. Oh, yeah. And um, I think that is a, it's something of that design is a quilt, but I don't know if that particular mm -hmm. object is one, but that's another, yeah. another item from the collection. Um, here's a, this is a, this is a question about something uh, that I would love to consider for the future. And that is, has microscopic examination of fibers in Emily Dickinson's shawl revealed evidence of trace amounts of matter such as uh, come from the garden or kitchen that might hint at the way the shawl was worn, when it was worn, for what uses? I love that question. And the answer is not yet, <laughs> um, but I that would be a really uh, wonderful thing to, mm -hmm. to look into. Um, and let's see, could one of the shawls have adorned a piano or other furniture? Um, it's really, uh, it's, that's a really interesting question. I mean, clearly by 1905, it was considered a, a, an object that, or a piece of textile that could um, adorn uh, household objects. And whether they were considered in that light in the period, you know, say 50 years earlier, I don't know. I'm really curious because we hear so many references to the shawl as a garment that wraps the body. And some of Emily Dickinson's own wonderful poetry likens it to various natural forms, the hills or the clouds. Um, so, but the ways in which it might have been you know, thrown onto a chair or placed over a piano. Uh, certainly we think of the Victorians as um, 
you know, <laughs> embellishing <Everything>. yeah. <laughs> their <laughs> furniture extensively. Yeah. So yeah. I wouldn't be surprised. Um, but I think that the material evidence I think we've found so far is the ways in which shawls were being worn in the period. But it would be wonderful to look at uh, paintings and photographs that might mm -hmm. show us something more. I wonder too, if, if it went out of style for women to wear them, if they still were considered these really nice pieces and used in a different way, actually covering furniture. So right. later in its life, maybe it was used that way. Absolutely. There was a, um, there was an object that, well, used to cover mantles. And uh, so I don't know all that much about this, but at one period of time, the mantle cover was um, not as much of a patterned piece, but really needed to cover up that mantle. And uh, I, it may be that at some point, it, uh, I thought I'd seen something about Paisley uh, being used on a mantle, but I'm not, you know, don't, don't quote me on that. <laughs> and that also, what you were just saying about the shawl as a garment reminded me, um, Susan Dickinson consulted Godey's Ladies Book. There are a few issues of that in uh, in their manuscript collection. At uh, I think they're at Brown. Wonderful. So that would be a terrific opportunity to look at some of the issues that she would have consulted. Yeah. Um, let's see. We uh, maybe can take just one uh, one more question. Um, Will the paper pieces embedded in the quilt blocks be analyzed? Mm. Okay, this is a question about um, what kind of object is this and what is your priority? So the uh, question continues, is there any evidence, evidence that Emily herself produced any of these blocks? And uh, uh, let's see, popular quilt patterns of Emily's day, but mm -hmm. this, com this combination of materials is, um, one that is troubling to, <laughs> troubling to them. Yes, yeah, we do have a lot of objects that, that combine material types. So so we have to be really considerate of, of all materials that make up an object. Um, so like the quilt block is, you know, it is it was created as a quilt. So it was meant to be a textile, but because it's unfinished, we still have the paper pieces. Mm -hmm. And because we are, the Emily Dickinson Museum, the paper is very important to us. Um, so I think we, we need to figure out ways that we can analyze that paper without really disturbing the integrity of the object itself. Um, so science, science somehow. Will, yeah, science will prevent. Yeah, so this this is an, kind of an ongoing question because it is, it is an object with um, really kind of so many opportunities for us. Um, and so, yeah, we will, we will be hopefully answering that question at some point. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, the obvious uh, parallel is Emily's later life fragments, right? I mean, it, it, the fragments are in the quilts and Emily's poetry, her words are fragments that um, now sort of have a life, that, that kind of appeal, uh, a life of their own almost. So. Well, this has been uh, just a tremendous conversation and presentation. I want to thank Lee Sanders for being with us and sharing her research and insights into the material history of textiles and how to read individual items such as Emily Dickinson's shawl uh, in context. And then we've got 8,000 more items that can be read <laughs> uh, in context. Um, and I want to thank all of you in the audience for joining us tonight from near and far. Uh, to hear more about the Emily Dickinson Museum and its collections. Um, I want to thank Megan Ramsey and Caitlin McGrath and the Institute for Museum and Library Services for their amazing three years of work and support in cataloging this collection and uh, making it accessible today to all users. Um, so th with this program, we conclude our 2023 behind the scenes with collections series. Um, recordings of all three of these programs are um, accessible on the website and tonight's program will be up um, shortly. Um, uh, and then we'll have more virtual and hybrid programs uh, uh, coming up uh, at the end of the month when our Tell It Slant Poetry Festival returns.
So just a few highlights of this festival include a workshop on digital tools now available for exploring Dickinson's life and work, including our new uh, collections database, which we're very proud of, but also all of those other digital tools that um, other institutions have and people have worked so hard to put together. Um, also the annual Emily Dickinson Poetry Reading Marathon, uh, where we read all 1,789 poems over roughly 14 hours throughout the week. Uh, comes around again. Uh, the Saturday Night Garden Party poetry readings by Marilyn Nelson and Abigail Chabotnoy are uh, one of the highlights of the festival. Uh, and there's just so much more coming up. So I hope you'll uh, go to our website to learn more and register for uh, these programs and others, um, or to make a donation that supports free programs like this one and all of those coming up uh, in the Poetry Festival in the coming weeks. Uh, so that's emilydickinsonmuseum.org. Thank you, Lise. Thank you, Megan. Uh, thank you all and good night.